Welcome sailors. I am so glad you're back with us for another uh, presentation from Navigari Yachting. Uh, in the last few webinars, I've been giving you updates about the status of the bases around the world. Uh, looks like uh, many of you are no longer on lockdown. Uh, turns out, uh, after giving some bad news about base closure, base closure, base closure, today I've got some great news. We have uh, our first base opening in two days, Saturday, we have boats going out in Croatia. And then a little over a month uh, from today on June 22nd, we expect our base in uh, Spain to be opening up. And then uh, we have Greece that's scheduled to open up on July 1st, but they're having some, uh, some internal debate about potentially opening a little bit sooner. So for those of you like me that need to get out and sail, uh, we have good news coming, and I'm so glad, uh, so glad to be able to present that to you. Um, now, the, the, the question that a lot of you have on your mind is the Virgin Islands. What is the status of the BVI? Um, as you may know, and if you've uh, been on other webinars, you've heard they're opening up in stages. They've gone through phase one, and that's internal opening. Uh, now the population's able to freely move around the country. And uh, June 2nd, um, BV Islanders are going to be able to enter the country. And phase two is really what opens up the Virgin Islands to the rest of the world. So we're hoping that uh, that, that comes soon. Uh, turns out a week from today, on May 28th, we will have the, uh, the update from the government in the British Virgin Islands that will give us all the specifics of phase two, currently tentatively set at, uh, at September 2nd. I'm sorry, September 1st. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see about that. My line of business, uh, all of everybody on, uh, on our team here gets lots of questions about uh, the, the whole tax planning side of putting a boat in a charter fleet. Really, what's the, what are the, uh, what are all of the, uh, the ins and outs of having a boat in the charter fleet? And um, I, I have to say, I was really lucky. Early on, I got some very sage advice, and I'm going to pass that on to you now. Uh, do not rely on advice from the person selling you the boat. Let me give you a few reasons. Now, uh, nearly everybody in our industry are reputable, uh, great people. Uh, that have absolutely no intention of uh, giving false information, but, but frankly, uh, it would be very unlikely that whoever's selling you the boat has a full picture of your personal finance, your business finance. So it's uh, you know, really, really unlikely that, that that's gonna be the case. So uh, the, uh, the other part of this is, um, that um, even, even CPAs, your CPA who does know your financial situation better uh, is, is potentially not fully aware of everything that's happening in the industry and, uh, and um, following up on all of the tax code. So we have uh, lots of people from around the world on this, uh, on this webinar, so happy. And again, welcome from the entire Navigari team. Uh, I have to say, I got, uh, got lucky once. In my travels, I happened to run across uh, uh, Kim and Jay Thorpe, uh, avid sailors, and uh, we got to talking about uh, putting a boat in a charter fleet. And, and it turns out Jay is extremely knowledgeable on the subject, and he has put together a team that is very well-versed on the legal side and on the, uh, the financial side. And uh, he's brought, uh, brought a team together. Uh, love, to, uh, love to let Jay tell you a little bit uh, more about how he got into this and why he is doing it. And uh, we're gonna have uh, time for about 30 minutes for 20 minutes for the presentation, about 10 minutes for questions and answers. And uh, so feel free to start uh, typing in your questions. I know we got a lot of questions coming in at the last minute that we weren't able to really prepare in the presentation. So if you submitted last minute questions, please resubmit those in the chat. So 
Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jay Thorpe. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure and I appreciate the opportunity to be on the web webinar with you. Um, I don't see Michael Fleishman. Michael Fleishman is our uh, legal partner, but I'm sure he may or may not be joining us here. Uh, he was there before. I hope he shows up again, but I'm, I'm very sure that we can field in general any questions in the event that he doesn't uh, jump back on. Anyway, uh, I, I wanted to tell you why Moonbands Charters and our affiliation uh, in, in the business. Uh, I'm sure that many of you on the webinar are what I would consider to be uh, uh, expertise businessmen, uh, people who have uh, a lot of experience on a lot of different things. And as, as you know, we're all very good at something, but we're not all very good at everything. Uh, and so this uh, concept is born out of a, out of a venture uh, where the yacht industry is very much different than many other industries. If any of you have attended one of the many shows, such as the last one we were at in Miami, uh, prior ones in, in Annapolis, or any of the shows, uh, you'll notice a, a, a line full of beautiful catamarans, wonderful people sitting on them, and we're all very anxious to talk to you about the benefits of boat as a business. Uh, unfortunately, despite their best efforts, uh, there's a built-in conflict of interest. Uh, they're there to sell you a boat, which in itself is fine, but in the same respect, uh, and in many regards, they're not equipped to address the many issues, business planning issues, uh, legal issues, and accounting issues uh, from a conflict of interest perspective that we are as, a, as an independent hands, uh, arm's length transaction type of buyer's agent. Uh, as, as a result, what we have developed is Moondance Yacht Charters and consultants. And the purpose behind them is if you want to compare it essentially to a buyer's agent for the business, boat as a business setup. Uh, it's very important that in addition to all the joy and fun you're going to have on the boat and all the benefits you're going to have to the boat, that you address all aspects of the boat. Is the, is the catamaran, the monohull, is it correct for you? Is it correct for your needs? Um, I don't think it's appropriate, or I don't believe it's appropriate to go into uh, these kinds of transactions without the benefit of the team behind you, because we're, if we're all smart enough, we all know that we all don't know everything. Hence, uh, I'm joined today uh, by uh, my associate, Michael Fleishman. Michael Fleishman is an attorney in Arizona. Uh, and I'm also joined by James Greening. Uh, he's an associate with Arizona Southwest CPAs. And we've formed an association to represent you as a buyer's agent uh, in the transaction as vote as a business. My role is one of making sure we drill down into the uh, business planning aspects of, of, of your boat, making sure that what you're trying to accomplish from a business objective is um, is right what you want. Uh, negotiating contracts, uh, my background is 35 years of sales and marketing, but really then it's a coordination between my associate, Michael, with regard to business transactions, business formation, and James with regard to accounting aspects of the business, uh, which is, as Phil uh, pointed out, is, is very uh, uh, complex uh, in its nature. Uh, and, and so I, what I don't want to do is go in, I, it, it's important to us that we address your questions more so than we sit here and give you a presentation. We want to be very specific about your questions and we look at this as the opportunity to introduce ourselves and at the same time in the future continue our conversations as they relate to you. Uh, Michael, you just want to spend a couple minutes on your aspect of this? Okay, looks like uh, well, just like everybody who's been having uh, having calls with their families over the coronavirus uh, crisis, looks like we might be having a little bit of uh, technical, technical difficulty with Michael. I think Michael's back, aren't you, Michael? Okay. Yeah. Um, 
if can you guys hear me okay yes okay yeah i, I apologize i've been having uh, I, i've frozen up at least three times trying to get back into the meeting so i apologize so yeah my uh you know my particular uh, angle on this is to uh provide sound legal advice uh in terms of uh, contract uh negotiation contract review uh entity structuring and uh making sure that we're working with uh, tax advisors to ensure that um, we basically cover uh, the, the full gamut of uh, opportunities, uh, both legally and financially. James? Well, everybody, yeah, I'd have to agree with Michael. Um, you know, sitting from the tax and accounting point, um, we wanna make sure that we can provide all boat owners, whether you're just getting into it or you've been into it for years, uh, we wanna make sure we give you sound uh, consultation on that, on the proper way to make it most beneficial for you. I mean, let's face it, you've earned a lot of, uh, uh, you spent a lot of money on the yacht or you're getting ready to, and you already spent, uh, you know, you already paid your income tax on that. So why pay more tax than what you legally have to? And so to be able to come and, and provide those details for you on a one-on-one -on -one situation, because as we've, uh, as you very well know, and what we've learned through the years is that, uh, you know, there's no general one size fits all. Um, so just like all your boats are unique, uh, all your situations tax wise and legal wise and chartering wise are unique as well. Well, so, thank, thank you, James. I'm, I'm uh, most certain that you were, you that, uh, that we were, um, Able to uh, able to save on taxes. I I I I can't see everybody on this webinar, but I think you just put uh, lots of smiles on everybody's faces. And if you don't mind, uh, we've received quite a few questions from uh, from our webinar guests uh, over email, and I'd like to uh, dive right into the questions. and And I'm glad to have you uh, jump in. And by the way. Uh, we haven't had any uh, practice or rehearsal. I have no idea uh, how how um, crazy the questions and answers will be. Uh, if they're going to make me uh, smile or cringe or whatever, but uh, I, I think you've found from all of the webinars we've had so far, uh, we're just here to uh, to put out uh, uh, the, the the most direct and uh, and most informative information we have. Uh, irregardless of, of how it falls for uh, for us. So, um, kind of a basic question, what's the difference between passive and active income and how does it relate to this business? James, that's a perfect question for you. Yeah, definitely. So that's a great question. And I think in order to answer that question, what you need to look at is uh, since 1986, the IRS has basically split uh, income into three different sections, and you know, being boaters, uh, I'd say let's let's look at this as like uh, we're at uh, Sault Ste. Marie, and we're going in the canal locks there or canal locks. Um, you know, there's three different locks, and whatever boat your lock goes into, you've got to stay in that lock, and that's the same way with income and expenses and depreciation. They all kind of fall into three categories. And those three categories for the IRS is active income. So active income would be your W-2s, uh, your Schedule C, so that includes like 1099 income, uh, or maybe a K-1 from another active business that maybe you're a partner in or whatever that you get a K-1 from. So that is considered all active income. Uh, and then the second one that doesn't really pertain, that's portfolio income. So you're looking at, you know, uh, uh, interest, dividends, capital gains, those kind of things. And then the third category is the passive income. So passive income is commonly on your Schedule E to throw out the IRS form. But what that mainly is, is uh, consists of rental income. That's the majority of what's going to be there. And so... Think of passive as you're really not doing anything besides collecting rent money, right? Um, you usually have a property manager that would be handling your, your rentals. Uh, so you're really hands off, you're just collecting whatever's left from the rent. So that would be your passive income. Uh, when we're looking at it from a boating perspective and a boat as a business, 
there are stipulations on whether your boat business will fall into the first category of active or the third category of passive. Um, and to say one way is better than the other only depends on your current tax situation. You know, let's say that you have a high W-2 um, that you're looking to decrease uh, that's taxable income. Well, then it would probably be more beneficial for you to have a boating business that's active because then the depreciation from Section 179, as well as a special allocation that's only available for the next two years, um, that we could apply depreciation to that. Then you're going to look at maybe putting your boat as an active business. And then you're going to want active charter membership, which is different from the passive. Uh, because there are stipulations on what qualifies you and the boat business as an active business. Um, and we can get into those details if you want on a one-on-one -on -one consultation, but you know, they are complicated and uh, you know, Michael uh, would probably have some input on that as well. But going back, you may want to have a passive boat business because let's say you've had commercial real estate rentals for 20 years, right? They're almost all paid for, or they are paid for and you're just bringing in an income, well then you want less taxable income in the passive. So you want a passive boat business that may help the expenses and the lifelong depreciation that's available in passive income to take that down. Wow, that was, um, I, I, I just learned a lot and I thought I knew, uh, knew a lot about this. Um, you mentioned um, uh, section 179 and assuming somebody has a big taxable event, um, can, you, can you explain maybe a little more about uh, Section 179 and, and how that may be applicable? Sure, definitely. So Section 179, it's kind of being phased out right now, so, um, but everybody knows that as Section 179. And what that is, is basically it's a fixed asset depreciation schedule. So if you're active income, um, you know, you have a Schedule C, and you bring in a boat that you just purchased, then that's gonna be a fixed asset. So on that fixed asset, uh, Section 179 allows several different kinds of depreciation to occur with that. So why you want depreciation is basically it's considered an expense on your, uh, on your 1040 or on your business entity, and that takes down your taxable income. So, there may be situations where you almost want to take the whole amount of that, of that fixed asset cost. You know? And so depending on how much income you have coming in would determine you know, that was what we'd be guiding you through is how much of that depreciation you want to take. So there are several different kinds of ske schedules of depreciation within section 179 that allows you to kind of pick and choose what's going to be best for your fixed asset. Now under section 179 for just a few more years, there's also a special allocation. The special allocation actually would allow you, so if you're a business, if your business entity is the one that's titled the boat, then it can take all the section 179 at once. But for just a few years, we can actually take depreciation on 179 and also take some special allocation of depreciation that skips the entity and goes to your individual 1040. So if you're the owner. So that's why we could actually look at, let's say the business of your boating is, you know, pretty, pretty even between expenses. You didn't have a lot of profit. But we could take a little depreciation there to make that as little taxable income as possible. Then we can special allocate the rest to your 1040 that maybe individually you are bringing in more on your W-2 you can actually allocate some of that depreciation to your Schedule C. Wow, I think you just um, piqued a lot of curiosity. So yeah. uh, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, that, that was uh, quite surprising. I, I, I think we're gonna get uh, a, a lot of interest and more explanation in that. Um, while we have Michael on the phone uh, or on the line, Michael, are you, uh, are you with us? Do we have a frozen Michael or a live Michael? Either way is handsome. Okay. Um, let me, uh, Jay, I'll, I'll let you answer uh, for Michael on this one. Oh, um, uh, what are the important steps that, um, that somebody should take as they're preparing to, uh, to put a boat as a business? Uh, Michael, you may want to address that from uh, 
uh, kind of upfront business uh, perspective. Uh, it seems we're losing Michael, so for, for some reason he doesn't uh, hear us. Uh, I can take that question. Uh, I think that, that there's a, a difference between what your business plan is as an individual and what your business formation needs to be from a legal and accounting basis. And what I mean by that is when you get into the, and this is an area, Phil, that I know that you're very versed, uh, you have to decide as an individual what your business plan is going to be. What am I going to use the boat for? I saw a number of questions uh, on the panel here that said, I want to use a lot of the time for my own, but I also want to charter it. Uh, some people may want to use the boat one or two times a year and not so much worried about free time or vacation time. They may want to use it as a, a, uh, a tax vehicle uh, that, that provides them in a way they want. But the bottom line is there's two separations. There's the boat and there's the business formation. And I think what you may be getting at in this case is the business formation. It, it's very important that you put the business formation, that is uh, the LLC or other entity, in the place prior to the delivery of the boat. Now, when you get or if you get financing on this, although it doesn't happen often, there's a lot of uh, similarities between um, real estate and boating in as much as you're, you're financing the boat. Uh, in most cases, you're financing this in a personal basis. Um, you wanna make sure that anything you do in the terms of a business formation is not uh, uh, triggering a due on sale clause or anything of that respect. So it's very important that a business be formed, an LLC be formed, and a, and a whole business plan be formed prior uh, to you taking delivery of any yacht. Uh, Michael, I see that you may be back on. Do you want to add anything to that? Maybe we have them in picture only. Okay. We have. So if we answer the question, we can go. I just want to make sure we we get to that part. If if, if there needs to be further explanation on it. Okay, I think we have um, cardboard cutout Mark again. I mean, Michael. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully he'll be back. So, um, you know, most uh, most boat buyers that are putting their boat in a business, they'll they'll purchase the boat under their own name, uh, and then because oftentimes it's a year or two years out, they don't necessarily want to start the LLC. Uh, is it okay to do that and then assign the contract, the purchase agreement to the LLC or the business entity uh, when the boat is arrived and, and ready to be registered? Um, James, you may want to take a shot at that. I have, I have some uh, comments on that as well, but James, you might want to take a shot at that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's definitely advisable that if you know you're actually going to do a, you know, the boat is actually going to be a business to actually get the title in the business's entity's name. Um, and, you know, so I know it may be hard, you know, to get financing with the entity name on it uh, at first, especially if you're just starting that entity doesn't have any credit to back its worth. But, um, you know, as soon as possible, and, you, and if you follow what Jay said and actually have a business plan beforehand, and you know that that's what you're going to do, it's highly recommendable to get that boat in the uh, entity's name on the title as soon as possible. Yeah, and, and just to follow up on that a little bit, uh, you, in most cases, and I'll speak for myself and many other people, they have to personally, with the financing, uh, personally guarantee it. Uh, but it's, it's very important that, that you make sure when you go through your financing scenario that uh the boat is assignable into another entity number one and number two you're not triggering any clause clauses that would create a uh, uh a business uh, uh a do on sale type of clause or a balloon payment on the boat doesn't happen often but it doesn't hurt to answer that question or have that question answered for you Okay, and and um, what are the what are the restrictions uh, for allowable personal use and uh, and uh, use of the boat? Can uh, can somebody with a boat in a business use their boat all the time? Are there uh, limitations or restrictions? 
or is it uh, different for different cases? Good question, Phil. Um, a lot of that falls into your wheelhouse as a yacht charter broker. Many yacht charter brokers uh, put uh, brokerage restrictions on different programs you have, i.e. the guaranteed program or the value program you presently offer versus what we would call an active management program. So I want to address the active management program first. Uh, the active management program, generally speaking, your yacht charter companies do not have a restriction on how much you can use the boat. The downside to that is that every time you use a boat, let's use a, a great example of the British Virgin Islands, you want to use a boat for two weeks in February. Well, that may be all right if it's not booked, but what you're doing if, you, if you're trying to generate and create income, as Phil would tell you, January through April is prime seasons. Uh, it gets prime chartering money. So your use of the boat, uh, although legally permissible and there's no issue with it, uh, you're taking away from valuable income that would be going into your, your pocket or your, uh, your, your business. Okay, uh, so, so, so if I'm hearing correctly, the, um, the, there, there really isn't a restriction on the allowable personal use that, um, that somebody could use uh, their boat in the program or are, are there restrictions uh, from a, a tax side or a, a legal side, I think was. I'm, I'm not aware of any restrictions, are you James? The, the, the only restriction I would say is if you are, if you've decided to go the active business route with this, then the only restriction is if you choose the test that, you know, you have so many hours on the boat that you've actually worked. Uh, the only thing you have to watch is, is that you're actually working on the boat when you're personally using it, if you're going to count those hours. Um, so let's say you, you know, you're the captain for a party, then that's actually working on the boat. But if you try to claim a hundred hours of work on the boat when you were just taking it out personally, that may not qualify you for that. So that would be the only thing I would watch out for. Yeah, great, uh, great point. Um, the, the, the hundred hours, there's a, there's a difference between the, the, uh, the hobby law rule does, does specify that uh, an owner would need to work on the boat for, for or on the business uh, for a minimum of 100 hours. I think there are other, other limits for, uh, for other things, but really the, the minimum is 100 hours. So going to boat shows, uh, traveling to see the boat, um, uh, spending time working on, on building the business with, uh, with a legal type team, financial team, do all of those qualify as the time for the uh, for the participation, active participation in the business? So it's a great question, and it's it's one that you know I wish I could just generally answer. Uh, we would actually have to look at the specifics because in previous you know uh, tax court cases, sometimes the travel counts, sometimes it doesn't. So if you're trying to claim the travel expense to going to your boat. And while you're on the boat, you spend uh, three days, you know, chartering people around on it. And then the other three days you take just personally, then that's where it gets kind of gray, where you're going to have to probably take half that travel expense because only half of it was where you were actually working on the boat. Um, and so, but, you know, if you're spending time marketing the boat, uh, you know, advertising, cleaning, all those kind of things. Yes, that does count, and those would be expenses that you'd be able to take. Yeah. As, that, as, it turns that, out, as it turns out, most of our most of our owners, uh, because you can use uh, both uh, both um, uh, the spouse's time as well, are end up putting in three, four, five, six hundred hours. So it seems like that's a, a, a relatively easy uh, easy. Uh, target to uh, to meet. Um, I, we got a question from Gavin. Uh, passive and active businesses are not mutually exclusive, are they? So, it you can't uh, the, and basically in the same year you can't switch. And the IRS actually doesn't like you to 
you know, jump back and forth from year to year, depending on it. I mean, if, if you just want to take your boat out for the whole year and not worry about it and just be passive, that's okay. But if you're going back and forth, they're not going to like that. Um, but if, if uh, Gavin actually means like passive and active businesses can actually work together, they can work together as long as they're separate entities. But if an entity says it's active, it's got to remain active. And if, uh, you know, and it can work with uh, a charter company and, you know, be passive and, you know, that, that charter company can be passive. It can work with other entities that are different, but the entity itself has to stay within one or the other. Okay, I'd like, uh, I'd like to invite everybody to, uh, to uh, type into the chat any questions that they had. Love to, uh, love to get, uh, get some questions coming in. Uh, we do have another one. Um, the, uh, is the Navigari Complete Program a, a, an example of the Passive Investment Program? And so, uh, uh, actually, the, there's a, a bit of a revision in the question now. Uh, the, the complete program does not allow for uh, for active uh, a, a, an active uh, participation company. So uh, the complete is really geared towards passive. Our ultimate program, the contracts are written up uh, specifically to comply with uh, with the current laws uh, for for active uh, participation. And, and that's by design, Philip. I mean, a lot of whether it's active or pa passive management is really based upon what your business objectives are. Uh, um, and that, that goes to business planning ahead of time on this. Yes, yes. And it's really important. You know, it's funny. I, um, I'm a, I, well, I'm a lot nerd, uh, but I've, I've read the majority of the cases, maybe all of the cases that have gone before the IRS. And it seems like one of the one of the factors that keeps coming up, you, you'd think uh, businesses would be would lose a case, uh, but they started off by writing a business plan, and they modified the plan. Even a simple uh, back of the envelope plan, or you know, a, a, a three page plan, has passed scrutiny with the IRS. Whereas in other cases where there wasn't a business plan. Uh, and the owners were just kind of winging it. Uh, that did not seem to uh, seem to pass muster. So uh, it, it 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 seems like starting off and getting sound advice from the beginning uh, with a business plan is really uh, really a key to this. Uh, Philip, I see that we're getting a question from uh, Robert Carrillo. Uh, were you able to get that? He's wondering. Yeah, let me, you, I'm going I'm to run down the list of questions. Uh, okay. we, we, we've gotten a couple, um, and actually uh, some by email previously. And um, how? And, and actually, uh, uh, Rob uh, actually asked this question in a if, in a different format. But this question comes from Stephen. Um, um, how does the recapture? impact the scenario and whether I decide to keep the yacht after its charter life? Um, I'll let James handle that because uh, he's smarter than I am. However, I, I have some personal <laughs> viewpoints on that. Uh, number one, part of a business plan is not only understanding uh, the like type financing and the business plan of the boat prior to you purchasing it, but equal thought needs to go into what your strategy is um, upon uh, the completion of your yacht, yacht charter management agreement. One of the things that has really driven me, and again, uh, Philip understands this, I'm very um, open, um, really honest broker through this. We deal with Navigari but we also deal through other charter companies and full disclosure. However, uh, one of the benefits that Navigari brings to this that I've yet to see in, in other charter companies is the fact that Navigari, if you wish, has a program that lasts for seven years. So in other words, instead of having to make a decision on an exit program in five years or four years or three years in some cases, Navigari, because of the way they manage and maintain their boats, they are able to provide a contract that extends for seven years. 
And uh, that really addresses a couple issues. Uh, what the value of your boat is in seven years versus how much you owe on it. And also the recapture of the boat. And perhaps you can speak to recapture as well. Okay. So. Um, do you need to speak to recapture at all? Pardon me? No, okay. Does that no, help? I think, I think you pretty much answered the answer, AJ. So. So um, we're uh, we're really bumping against our uh, our time, but I, I have a question here um, uh, regarding um, the, the um, ROI. Uh, um, how, what, what does the ROI look like on the years when the boat is no longer in charter, uh, but the owner still has to pay the interest and the 179 depreciation is reduced? Uh, I'm not, I, I, that one's so uh, over me, I can't uh, understand the question, but I'm, I'm sure the financial minds will. Uh, I'm not so sure I understand where, uh, where that question is going, but let, let me take a stab at it and then James as well. Uh, we just talked about Navigari having up to a seven year uh, plan for charter. Uh, this is very important, and this is a, this is kind of a tidbit of some of the things that we do that you as buyers should be on the watch out for. There are many companies out there that you see at the shows and things of that respect will show you performers on best case scenarios, such as uh, uh, amortizing the boat on a 20 year plan. That's okay if you want to do it, but the disadvantage of that is. When you turn around and you, you sell your boat, you uh, and most li most likely will be upside down in that boat on a plan. The way you should look at a plan if it's financially viable given your situation is between 13 and 15 years, and you should work on a seven year program that Navigari, in my opinion, is only an exclusive offering. What that does is that gives you whatever your amortization and payout is in seven years, and uh, most likely you'll be way into the equity of the boat at that point in time, and it will be a much more liquid asset, uh, allowing you to sell it much easier. Uh, James, do you have any questions on it? Or do you have any comments on that? I would just say too that uh, it looks like from you know the question, Stephen, is that. You know, if the boat is no longer in charter, then it's going to probably fall out of the capability to be an active uh, boat business, and you're going to have to switch to passive. Once you do that, you're going to lose your Section 179 depreciation. Uh, you can then change to a regular lifelong lifespan depreciation under passive. So it's going to be definitely less. Um, so your return on investment, you know, at, at that point, yeah, it's going to be lower, but the depreciation may at least, and the interest would still at least be called as passive expenses. So it would help your passive income uh, tax-wise, but you know, return on investment, that's, that's hard to say. Well, and, and again, one other, one other area is once it gets out of the, uh, a, a contract with Navigaria, what I would consider to be a first tier yacht charter company, uh, you can choose to put your boat into a second tier Yacht charter companies to continue charter, such as Punk or BBI. There's a lot of second tier companies out there that are looking for uh, yachts in very good condition coming out of charter, and you can start that process essentially over in an active management perspective. Or, or, or as Philip Winter would say, uh, we'll we'll trade it in and get you into a new boat and start That's with with the higher revenue. Sure. <laughs> new boat. Um, we have Sarah who's asked us a couple of questions. Uh, purchasing in the name of my personal property or trust or buying cash, no financing, do I still need to have an LLC in advance of the purchase? And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preface some, this just a little bit by um, making an assumption that Sarah wants to put this in an active participation. Being that Michael's not here, James, you want to take a shot at that, or you want me to, or? Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I, legally speaking, you know, I, I don't want to step on the on those toes, but I would say, you know, if you use the funds 
uh, from a personal trust or whatever to actually purchase the bow outright, then actually it'd probably be very easy for you to change it into the LLCs uh, to, to have the title over since you've probably paid it outright. Um, so at that point, then I would say it's even, even easier to do, but very, very advisable to do, especially if you're gonna be an active business you want that boat to be in the in the title of the entity. Uh, and and if I can just expand on that a little bit, and Michael Michael and I have had conversations on this. So I'll somewhat speak on uh, on his part. Putting it in a separate entity provides you not total protection from liability or total protection, but it's it's a much better protection vehicle, uh, an additional entity, whether it's a a subchapter as or an LLC, it provides you legal protection against personal suits uh, up to a given point. And that's where I would say that 90% uh, of the people in the business put it in a separate entity in terms of the protections of the asset and personal protections. That's kind of a one-on-one -on -one discussion to have with uh, Michael. And uh, a question from Tim. Uh, do you have any type of spreadsheet for us to use to get a rough idea of how this works? Enter income, enter boat costs, enter expenses, et cetera. And Tim, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, let you know that uh, if you work with anybody on the Navigari team, we have a, um, a calculator that we can, uh, we can punch those numbers in and, and get you information. What it doesn't do is uh, give you any value for the depreciation or any, any tax planning uh, advantages that you may have. That's all gonna be a bonus on top of uh, the revenue uh, that you would, uh, you would earn in uh, having a boat in, in the business. Um, we're, we're a little over time, but um, a, um, I, 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 I get a lot of questions uh, this time of the world about how is the coronavirus affecting the business and uh, really what, what's, what's, what's going to happen in the charter business. First of all, uh, the major players in the business are strong. Uh, we're all going through some, some pretty stiff measures to, uh, uh, to make sure that we are solvent and strong in the future. Putting a boat in a charter fleet is really a long-term investment. So you're looking at something that is not, uh, not something you're looking at because of today's situation. You're really looking at uh, where we're gonna be in five years, seven years down the road. So uh, I, I think it's an extremely good time. Uh, we got great deals on, uh, on boats right now. And by in seven years, I would expect that uh, boats are going to be uh, at a premium. The, we should have a, a very robust market at that time. And uh, so we really need to look at the finances over the long term as opposed to over the short term. And, and the, uh, all of the depreciation and uh, the, the, the value that you can have from the boat uh, as a business uh, r right away, that happens regardless of, of what's happening in the economy. So uh, uh, I do, do I want to uh, um, kind of off because we have um, we wanted to keep it uh, keep it right to the uh, the right amount of time. Uh, but we've gotten a couple of questions. Thank you very much for asking this. Um, contact information for. Uh, uh, for Jay, uh, can you can you uh, give your contact information? If we were really slick, I'd be able to put a slide up. Just have no idea how to do it on uh, on this uh, this webinar. Uh, but uh, uh, Jay, you've brought together uh, the legal side, the financial side. Can you uh, can you give your con uh, contact information? Uh, yeah, we have a we have a a, a website. Uh, it's called MoondanceYachtCharters.com. Uh, it is under construction right now because we've taken this opportunity uh, to make some changes to the website that, that are um, kind of in, in, in concert with the things going on. So there's a lot of changes taking place. It should be up and running uh, in the next, uh, I would say, uh, three days to a week. 
we are available immediately. My email is j at moondanceyachtcharters.com. And my direct phone number is 520-441-9357. Uh, we work hand in hand with Philip, uh, Jasper, and his team. And uh, we are here uh, uh, as, as a service to the buyer. And uh, uh, going into this unarmed is, is, is not the best exercise you can do without some type of objective representation. So, Philip, I appreciate the time you've given us to uh, kind of lay out our plans. Okay, so uh, if, if uh, somebody came to you, Jay, you'd be able to help them write a business plan, uh, look at their finances, help set up a legal entity, and, uh, and help them through the whole process of, of putting a boat into business. And, um, and, and, and I'm, I'm actually, um, uh, I mean, uh, really the, the, the soup to nuts of boat yes. business. Uh, can you do that? Yes. Uh, and there's one other area, Philip, that we haven't had the opportunity to talk about here is we're affiliated as well with uh, website development, uh, uh, search engine optimization, and brand management because part of active management is the development of a website. So we have a specialist in that area as well to fill out the team from a marketing perspective to make sure that you can uh, fill, fulfill the uh, IRS uh, rules with regard to active management. So yeah, we're kind of full service on the buyer side. Fantastic. So um, when we, um, in the next day or two, we'll have this, uh, this video put together. We'll make sure to put uh, your contact information up and uh, love to help anybody out there with uh, with questions uh, get them answered uh, if you're uh, um, the, the the part that I didn't disqualify disqualify myself from at the very beginning uh, the, the legal side financial side on the boating side I'm fortunate enough to have spent my life in the business uh, around the world and I will be glad to answer any questions you have. So uh, we're uh, just a few minutes late. So uh, I, I wanna thank everybody for staying with us, asking the great questions. Uh, if your question didn't get answered, we had a bunch more that have come in. Uh, I will, uh, would love to answer them uh, offline personally. Feel free to email me, philip at navigari-yachting.com and uh, you can get me right off our website. Uh, on behalf of the, the entire team, thank you, and we look forward to seeing you out on the water. Thanks, everybody. Take care.